It's a pleasure to be here. I, I see, I think in Beijing, it's, uh, it's evening, so it's an evening talk. Okay, uh, so what about knowing you from electricity? Let me give uh, a few definitions before, just to recall the setting. And uh, okay, what I'm going to talk about is uh, both uh, integral functionals of the calculus of variations of the type you see on the screen and related quasi-linear elliptic equations uh, in, of this type in divergence form. And of course, the catch between the two is given by considering the euler lagrange equation of the, of the first. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about both uh, minimizers and solutions uh, with special emphasis on, the, on minimizers, so on the variational case. Okay, what about uh, ellipticity? So ellipticity of the equation and of the functional is usually prescribed um, saying that all the eigenvalues are positive definite. And uh, so we introduce these two functions, G1 and G2. They both depend on X and on the gradient variable Z because it would be as much uh, uh, as general as possible. Um, um, and um, essentially the role of the two functions G1 and G2 are, um, uh, is that the first is bounding uh, the lowest eigenvalue from below. And the second is bounding the highest eigenvalue from above. And uh, okay, what it matters in elliptic regularity theory is actually uh, the ratio between these two. Because this quantity uh, essentially, and essentially it's the behavior at infinity uh, of this ratio because this quantity enters in all the regularity estimates you might like to have. So when, uh, uh, whenever you try to make some regularity estimate is uh, then this, uh, this ratio um, comes up. And essentially, when you are considering a symmetric vector field of this type, so a vector field A whose derivative is symmetric, which is always the case in the variational case, then you are just considering this, uh, this is what I call ellipticity ratio. That's the ratio between the highest and the lowest eigenvalue, point by point. It's a pointwise ratio. Uh, just let me recall the fact that um, uh, um, you might have a uniformly elliptic uh, equation, and this happens when this ratio keeps bounded. So uniform ellipticity means that this ratio keeps bounded, but uh, a uniformly elliptic equation can still be so-called degenerate, and this happens when, the, when there's no lower bound. Uh, there's no lower bound on this uh, on this um, on this quantity, um, uh, in the sense that this quantity might be zero. For instance, this is the case of the Pilaplacian equation, which is a perfectly uniformly elliptic equation, but nevertheless is degenerate and is degenerate, for instance, when P is larger than two and Z is zero. So you lose control from below, but still it's a uniformly elliptic uh, equation. And that's why the so-called Weyerhaeuser-Wollenbeck theory works because what you use is this ratio in, in, at every stage. Okay, so what is non-uniform ellipticity is uh, what you can easily imagine at this stage. Uh, so when this ratio goes to plus infinity, so when you have no control, no uniform control on this ratio, then you are in presence of a non-uniformly elliptic operator or an equation. And, um, and you see, this is very critical because uh, a, main, a main point in proving regularity it's proving that the solutions are Lipschitz, that is the gradient is locally bounded. In order to prove that the gradient is locally bounded, then you use that this quantity keeps bounded. But on the other end, in non-uniform ellipticity, then this quantity keeps, uh, I mean, uh, you cannot keep this quantity unbounded, uh, bounded, and therefore there's a competition. On one hand, you would like to have the gradient, a bounded gradient, on the other end to prove this, you use, you use this quantity that is blowing up essentially when the gradient tends to be unbounded. And of course, similar definitions can be given, uh, can be given by um, in uh, non-divergence um, non equations, in equations of this type, uh, and uh, uh, where you prescribe a lower and an upper bound on G1 and G2. And this is the point. Okay, this is a classical topic actually. And this is a classical topic since, uh, um, since the 50s, there are pioneering papers by Finn. And uh, here there's a, a number of people who proved important results in the, in the, 
in the theory. And of course, a typical example of a non-uniformly elliptic operator is given by a minimal surface uh, equation. And, um, and um, but this is just an example. Then and in that case, you have a special additional structure that allows for more, for more things. But in general case, many authors, and these are a few ones that uh, worked, on the, uh, worked on the problem. In particular, there are classical papers by Lagzinska and Duyalsova, by Gilberg, Stampakia, there's the St. Petersburg School, uh, people like Ivochkin, Oskolkov, Ivanov. Then there's a famous uh, classical, by now classical paper by Seyrin, and there's the thesis of Tudinger, a beautiful paper by Leon Simon. Um, more relatively recent uh, contributions are given by these papers. And in these papers, again, I would like to emphasize the contributions of Zhikov. I'm going to talk about this later on. And in particular, there's a, a monograph by Ivanov that summarizes more or less the progress uh, that was made in St. Petersburg until the beginning of the 80s. And then there are these pioneering papers of Marcellini who established a very neat and basic uh, um, interior estimates. That's the important thing in Marcellini's theory. It doesn't require boundary data or barriers or whatever, as was done in many cases before. It's purely, uh, uh, it, develops, it develops a purely interior theory with uh, many, many uh, results. I'm going to talk about this later on too. Okay, this is a classical uh, paper of Lagishenska that we also was talking uh, before, and these are classical Trudinger's papers and uh, so forth. And um, this is the Leon Simon's papers. Um, and here in the, in the first page, you can see, for instance, the, the, the classical Michael Simon inequality. Uh, that's so prolific equality on manifolds and it involves the main curvature as it, as it is well known. These are classical papers and tools used in this setting where special structures are used. Uh, um, you can see, for instance, the operators of minimal surfaces here. Okay, uh, so let me summarize. Uh, let me summarize. Uh, and uh, so uh, what I'm going to talk about are these variational integrals, especially variational integrals. And uh, when I fix X, I do consider the ellipticity ratio and uh, we will be in presence of uh, uh, a blowing up ellipticity ratio, a blowing, uh, uh, electricity ratio at infinity, so this quantity doesn't keep bounded. That's uh, a main point in this theory. So keep uh, keep in mind this definition. That's the, the so-called, what I usually call the electricity ratio. Okay, uh, as I told you, there's a competition uh, because you want to prove that the gradient is bounded, but you have to use that the electricity ratio is bounded and therefore this might blow up. So a typical assumption, which is classical in the theory, uh, since the 60s, actually, is uh, that uh, everybody's assuming, in a way or in another, that this ellipticity blows up as a power of the gradient. So it blows up as a power of z. And it blows up with a power um, uh, which is, in fact, not allowed it to be too large. And in particular, in the case of functionals, this, is a, uh, this can be achieved by prescribing that the lower eigenvalue uh, at infinity grows uh, with this polynomial uh, with this polynomial growth and the upper and the upper one is bounded by this quantity therefore the ratio keeps uniformly bounded in the following in the following sense it's bounded uh, and grows up as a power so it's it's bounded once you renormalize with a power and uh, this is uh, this connects to the setting the by I by now classical setting of Paolo Marcellini, where uh, in a series of papers in the 80s, um, he considered uh, fun general functionals with so-called PQ growth conditions. So you, and these were motivated initially, Paolo's motivation was uh, initially given by problems in nonlinear elasticity. In fact, uh, Marcellini has introduced uh, um, um, an approach, a very interesting approach to cavitation in nonlinear elasticity, which is in my opinion, a very interesting one and should be, um, should be, uh, should be uh, studied a bit, uh, a bit more than what it has been done up to now, because uh, uh, it is really an interesting uh, uh, viewpoint. So he considered, motivated by elasticity, general functionals with coercivity properties at rate p that are strictly lower than boundness properties. This is uh, classical when you consider uh, determinants, for instance, functionals, including the determinants. 
And of course, these assumptions, uh, they do consider the usual ones, the assumptions on second derivatives are uh, connected to the, to the assumptions on F, um, uh, scaled by two. Therefore, the ratio still verifies these classical assumptions that was considered, uh, uh, that were considered in the literature. Okay, the main point is that these assumptions uh, are not technical, but must be there. For instance, uh, uh, a main, uh, um, main model example of theorems that you can get by Marcellini and uh, by also other authors is the following. You take a variational integral with PQ growth condition, uh, when you also prescribe uh, this one, so you prescribe both convexity um, and growth at PQ level, and then you see that if you assume that the gap, the ratio between Q and P is not far from being one, that is Q is not too large, uh, too, I mean, too far from P, then you can prove regularity uh, theorems. Otherwise there are counterexamples given by Merchellini and Jacqui. And usually this is of the type, uh, a constant over N goes to zero when N goes to plus infinity. Uh, okay, you can look at these papers by, by, by Merchellini and, um, um then there has been a lot of uh, a lot of work on this for instance many people devoted themselves to find the optimal bounds that are at the moment not known this is for instance a list of uh, of recent contributions and the only known optimal bound is one by Hirsch and Schaffner uh, where they proved uh, uh, that under this condition get uh, the using L infinity this is sharp because exactly a condition that occurs in counterexample uh, built by Merchellini at the end of the case. But this is just to give an example of what can be done. So the, the, the philosophy is that uh, you can allow the, the ellipticity ratio to blow up at infinity, but you cannot allow it to do uh, with a power which is uh, too large, too large, with a polynomial power which is too large. But on, on this, I'm going to be back later. Um, okay. Um, so, as I told you, for non-autonomous functionals, we can consider the following ellipticity ratio. So we freeze the integrand at one point, and we do consider this as a variable of z. And if this is uniformly bounded uh, uh, with, with respect to z at any point, and also uniformly with respect to x0, then there is no problem in considering uniform ellipticity. Um, But um, I could consider also, let's say, a larger version of this uh, ellipticity ratio. So the largest, uh, the largest version is not considering taking first the ratio and then do, making the soup. So with respect to x0 simultaneously, no. I first do the following, I do consider a ball, and then I do consider this no local uh, quantity. So I take the soup of the highest eigenvalue with respect to x in a ball, B, and the inf. So this gives me a larger quantity than the pointwise uniform uh, ellipticity ratio. And, uh, and this is the relation, of course. And the relation is exactly this one. So uh, this, uh, uh, this second uh, ellipticity ratio is bound to catch and detect milder forms of non-uniform ellipticity. Non-uniform ellipticity means that at every point, uh, uniform ellipticity means that at every point the ratio must be bounded. Here I, I make a no local variation of this, of the previous ratio. Okay, why this is important? Because already uh, the blow up of this quantity um, uh, is problematic. Uh, so let me, do, let me consider this functional originally introduced by Zhikov in the 80s in the setting of anisotropic materials, uh, elasticity, homogenization, Lorentz gap, and so forth. So this functional is a, a perfectly scalar convex. So you can also make it non-degenerate or synthetic with respect to the gradient variable, but that's not the point. Just consider the PA infinity. Um, so when A of X, which is, um, uh, uh, which is a, a, a modulating coefficient is zero, then the growth with respect to the gradient is at level P. Um, when uh, a of x is larger than zero, so at those points, uh, so I freeze, then, uh, th then the growth is with q rate, and q is larger than p. 
On the other end, at every point, the growth is always the same. So it's either P or it's Q. Now, if I take the pointwise ellipticity ratio of this quantity, so I take the soup of the inf of the highest and the lowest second value point by point, this is uniformly bounded. So you would expect, so you get a, a functional whose all Lagrange equation is uniformly elliptic in the classical sense, but still, and so you would expect that uh, all, the, all the, the, the classical facts hold in the, for these kinds of functionals. Uh, in, in particular, the perturbation theories should work. There are two basic perturbation theories in, in, in elliptic equations. These are Schauder theory and Calder and Zygmunt theory. So you would expect that these hold, but that's not the case. So in many, many years ago, we built the following counterexample. After a country, a, a one point singularity counterexample built uh, by Esposito, Renetti, and myself. So um, um, I, I can build um, so a, a coefficient, a very weird coefficient, but still elder continuous. And uh, then I can, uh, I can take Q and P far enough depending on the regularity with, uh, of A, such that a minimizer is not only discontinuous. Uh, but it has a, a set of essential discontinuity points uh, of maximal Hausdorff dimension. So a minimizer can be nearly as bad as any other competitor. Coefficients are, are, um, are held or continuous. So Schauder theory would tell you that the gradient itself should be held or continuous, but these minimizers are not even continuous. So this means that you have a perfectly uniformly elliptic functional, uh, but still you don't have uh, those features that you would expect coming along with uh, uniform ellipticity. So where's, uh, where's the point uh, is, that, uh, is that this is uniformly elliptic in the classical sense, but still non-uniformly elliptic when you, uh, when you use the, the, the larger non-local ellipticity ratio. Uh, let me tell you that anyway, uh, the catch between the dimension n alpha and the growth rate P and Q is critical here because many years later uh, with Paolo Bayon and Maria Colombo, then we were able to prove the following. If you, uh, if once again, the bound Q over P, the gap Q over P is uh, larger than one, but less than this quantity that now not only depends on N but also on alpha, then U is locally elder continuous. And this is obviously the best you, you can get in this case because that's the maximum regularity for the P Laplacian problem already when A of X is uh, constantly zero. So there's an interplay which has a, a capacitor, a delicate capacitor in nature that are some, uh, you can understand better the formation of counterexamples and of regularity using these weighted capacities in the style of uh, Mazia. But still now there's a bound that a similar bound allowing you to, to get this. And what happens in this functional, as I told you, every time you fix X, this quantity is perfectly bounded. And even if you, for a constant that is even independent of X, is even independent of X. So everything goes okay when you do consider this, uh, uh, the, the classical non-uniform uniform ellipses. But it happens that uh, if you do consider this non-local, ellipticity ratio, then this functional that according to the classical definition is uniformly elliptic turns out to be not. Why? Because if you take a ball where the transition between the two phases happens, that is A of X can be zero, then the lowest eigenvalue is like Z to the P minus two and the highest eigenvalue is controlled by this quantity. And therefore this quantity goes to plus infinity when Z goes to plus infinity. And the interplay between the regularity of coefficients and the growth of, uh, of the, uh, 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 with respect to the gradient happens exactly here. And this is discussed in a, a recent paper by De Filippis and myself, uh, by Cristiana De Filippis and myself, uh, uh, which is on the archive for rational mechanics this year. I mean, you can, uh, you can look at that for several theorems and mm, remarks about this definition, but, let me tell you that even in the milder case, things uh, might go wrong. 
Okay, what I'm going to talk about today, um, okay, this is a general overview. What I'm going to talk about today is, uh, is a series of new results obtained with Cristiana de Filippis, uh, where actually I do not consider this favorable case, this still favorable case, but I do consider the real non-uniform ellipticity, the tough one. So point by point, you do consider a non-uniformly elliptic integrand. And I want to know the impact of perturbation of, uh, with respect to X on the regularity of minimizers. That is, I want to know shadow estimates for non-uniformly elliptic theory. Um, uh, so you see that in this model case, when you do consider the ellipticity ratio, then C of X simplifies pointwise, and therefore this is still pointwise non-uniformly uh, non -uniformly elliptic. So this is not the case of the double phase function where this is satisfied. So, but still in the, in, in the double phase function of you, you, you have problems with regularity. In fact, in the double phase theory, you deeply use the fact that the functional is pointwise uniform elliptic. Here, we do not have this crucial information. So we, are go, we go to the real non-uniform ellipticity. So these are uh, results on the mild non-uniform ellipticity. So uh, recent results dealing with uh, dependence on coefficients. And in all such cases, the point is that the crucial assumption is then uh, when you take, uh, when you freeze X, then you get a, a uniformly elliptic integral. So this is not what I'm going to talk about today. So we want to go beyond this, uh, these papers. In particular, there's, uh, there are new interesting papers by Hester and Oak on this situation where they also give a more general view on previous papers by Bioni Colombo and myself and uh, Asherdi and myself, uh, and it's a more general theory. But still the crucial point is that you are in the classical non-uniformly elliptic setting. Okay, that's uh, shutter estimates. So let me just recall what shutter estimates are, but this should be, uh, okay, this is clear to most of the analysts uh, having, uh, having um, something in common with the elliptic equation. So as you know, harmonic functions are smooth and uh, the, the, the point of shutter estimates is the following. What happens if I do insert a so-called external ingredient like uh, an elliptic matrix? So the, the equation keeps being elliptic by this assumption, but we have coefficients. So what's the impact of coefficients on regularity of solutions from smooth to whatever? And if I can quantitatively uh, describe this impact. So that's the, the point of so-called shadow estimates. And uh, the, 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 what you can prove in the linear case is that, the, uh, as you see, that coefficients, they stick to the gradient. So you wouldn't expect that the gradient is more regular than coefficients, because otherwise it's easy to build counterexamples with external ingredients. But on the other hand, uh, the, 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 the content of uh, shadow, classical shadow estimates is that you can retrieve as much regularity on the gradient of solutions as you have initially on coefficients. Okay, in the classical case, this is not actually only Schauder, but it were, they were first proven by Hopf in a paper, I think, on the Mathematische Zeitschrift or something like that on 29, then by Renato Gacciopoli. Uh, so Hopf proved this in the interior. So the first proof of real Schauder estimates was given by Gacciopoli up to the boundary with a sharp exponent, again by Schauder, who extended uh, more the results of Gacciopoli. And then the last one who came took it all. Um, the winner takes it, takes it all, as uh, Abba would say. Uh, but actually, these are the three authors that first introduced the uh, uh, shadow estimates. Okay, the classical proofs are via potential theory because at that stage, we, they were in the infancy of uh, elliptic uh, regularity theory. So the only thing that we're able to do, and it's actually the only thing that you can do in these cases, perturbation. And so this was via fundamental solutions as such. And uh, this was extended by classical authors like Agmon, uh, Douglas Nirenberg, and so forth. But the, 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 the point is always the same. You take, uh, you freeze, you take the parametrics, you take uh, single, uh, I mean, singular or fractional integrals, and then you do computations. More lighter, uh, okay, lighter proofs have been given and more modern proofs are given by Campagnato, Tuninger, Leon Simon. But 
the essence is always the same. You make a comparison and perturbation argument. So you can do perturbations in several ways by, I mean, heavy pointwise perturbations. You can modify, you can blow up, but that's, uh, that's the nature of the problem. It's a perturbative argument. Uh, so what you do, for instance, in Campagnato's approach, you do the following. You so-called freeze the, in, uh, the, the coefficients, that's Korn's trick. And on solution of, uh, okay, when you freeze coefficients, then you get up to change of variables, uh, uh, Laplacian equation. On this, you introduce uh, these estimates. That's really the contribution of Campagnato and De Giorgi, putting, uh, uh, I mean, pointwise elder continuity in terms of integral estimates. So you make it mm, closer to uh, your nonlinear formulation. And this describes essentially the fact that the DV is Lipschitz continuous. On the other hand, by comparison, uh, you can prove these estimates so that the, the, the difference between uh, your original solution and the frozen one decays uh, as much as the regularity of coefficients allow. And when you combine these two things, then you can you can prove the other continuity of the gradient. Okay, what's the crucial point here is that these estimates are homogeneous. You see, it's two here, two here, and um, and since these estimates uh, are homogeneous, then they, are, they can be combined and iterated. Regularity is a matter of iterations, and when iterations and when estimates are not homogeneous, then there's a bit of a problem, I would say. In fact, uh, once you get these two estimates, then you can carry on the same argument to nonlinear equations. And Schauder theory for nonlinear equations is a more recent uh, contributions by Jermin and Giusti, Di Benedetto, Manfredi, and others. And let me give you a, a model example, but this actually works for a, a larger a class of examples like uh, uh, in uh, equations considered by Lagishinska and Duvalceva in, in divergence form when you put tailor coefficients. Okay, take the pila Laplacian operator. You had a coefficient. Uh, coefficients is uh, some hill is elder continuous, and then you prove that the gradient is elder continuous. Not with the same exponent, because that cannot be, because the equation is degenerate, but with some exponent, with, a, with, a, with an exponent which is actually the smallest one between what you would have without coefficients and the alpha given here. And the argument is essentially the same that you freeze and compare as before. And here, the crucial point is that you want to prove that the same nice estimates you actually have in the linear case, they hold in the, in the nonlinear case. That's uh, a bit of a problem here, but that's uh, essentially the contribution of, uh, of these authors and also other people. Uh, let me also uh, recall that you don't have to be uh, with standard polynomial growth, let's say with P growth, to be uniformly elliptic. Uh, any equation of this type without A of X being uh, polynomial, but still verifying this assumption, is uniformly elliptic. These equations were considered by Gary Lieberman. They can be whatever, so A tilde can be any function, but still satisfies these rebalancing conditions uh, with its derivatives. And, uh, and still you get that the, the gradient is other continuous. And still you can make a perturbation theory. And this is an achievement by Gary Lee Berman at the beginning of the 80s, but still you can make perturbation on the, on the, on the um, on the theory. So why uh, this theory is uh, delicate? Because you cannot differentiate the equation. Usually uh, to get gradient estimates, you take the equation, you differentiate the equations and you prove that the gradient satisfies a differentiated equation and then you can do other things. Here coefficients are held or continuous so no differentiability is allowed. And that's why you, you have to go to, to perturbation theories, perturbation arguments. But these perturbation arguments only work under homogeneous estimates that are in turn possible by, by uniform elliptic. Okay, there's another problem, which is more operational nature. And this is another classical result. Uh, let's say it's shadow theory for non-differentiable functions. So uh, let me consider this a model case. So I take an int, this is the classical model case considered by Jacquint and Juice in their papers. So you take, uh, um, a nice uni uh, uniformly elliptic integrand, capital F, 
And then you take a lower order term, which is non-differentiable with respect to B. That's the B, that's the, 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 the with Y, that, that, that's the variable B. So you cannot even write down the Euler Lagrange equation because it doesn't exist. So you cannot apply the theory uh, available for equations, but uh, you, you can rely directly on minimizers. This is an achievement, uh, uh, an important achievement by Giacomo Giusti at the beginning of the 80s. So by using directly minimizers, so without using your Lagrange equation, you can, uh, you can still prove that the gradient is order continuous. And you can even go to more delicate examples like this, because essentially the George's theory works for measurable coefficients, in fact. Again, without using the equation, but also only using minimality. So once you prove that minimizers are Hilder continuous, this coefficient becomes uh, globally Hilder continuous in a way. And this is what you prove to get directly, again, that the gradient is Hilder continuous without using the, the differentiated, uh, the Euler Lagrange equation. So these are two problems, let's say. So let me summarize these two problems. Uh, um, uh, the classical, the first classical fact in uniformly elliptic theory is the following. You get, uh, you get a uniformly uh, um, elliptic equation, you put coefficients and you want to get to prove that the U is other continuous. This is a classical fact. Uh, the second fact is, uh, let's say a step up. You take the same, but you cannot differentiate the functional, so you don't even have an equation, but still you, you, you want to prove that U is also continuous. So this is standard in the classical uniformly elliptic case. And these are two classical open problems in the non-uniformly elliptic theory. So this is not known, this was not known. So get me a uniformly elliptic over, a non-uniformly elliptic operator and make perturbation theory. So this is this is not known. This was not known. The second is that do the same, but with non-differentiable functionals. These are two classical open problems. And um, uh, today I would like to present solutions to the problems that are in a recent paper by Cristiana De Filippis and myself. And uh, the point, uh, the real contribution of this, uh, of this paper is that we introduce an approach with, uh, which is not really a perturbation approach, which, is, uh, which just partially relies on perturbation. And essentially we introduce the method to get, uh, uh, to get perturbation in a non-uniformly elliptic setting. Then there's a backbone, basic technique, and then you can apply these techniques uh, to general cases. In this paper, we provide a certain number of cases, but other, others are still possible. Okay, uh, let me get, uh, for instance, how this, this problem was discussed. This is the, 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 the original paper of Jacquinta Giusti, and there's a comment by Gary Lieberman. Lieberman explicitly mentions that uh, these results uh, they work in the uniformly elliptic case, uh, but in the non-uniformly elliptic case, they just don't work if you do not a priori assume that the gradient is bounded. But proving that the gradient is bounded is not always the case in non-uniform ellipticity. So the real point in non-uniform ellipticity, since the behavior of, uh, of the ellipticity ratio is studied at infinity, is what happens when the gradient is large. And in fact, uh, uh, Lieberman says that either you do consider our uh, bounded gradient or uh, the results, they do not apply simply. So this is one of the occurrence where this problem was raised. And this is the usual fact that the, the same problem that you can find in this old um, mono monograph by Ivanov, where he also uh, refers to Lagishinska and Dura-Alzara, where they say that, uh, that once you get a bounded gradient, then you can do essentially whatever you like uh, on the elliptic with the no uniform ellipticity. And otherwise, uh, there are problems. And this is, in fact, a, a typical theorem of, uh, of Lagishinska and Dura-Alzara for non uniformly elliptic problems. You see that there are two kinds of assumptions. First, we assume that the gradient is bound. And then there is this differentiability with respect to coefficients. So differentiability was removed by Jacquinta Giusti and all these people between the 70s and the 80s, but the hard assumption has never been removed. And this is what we do for the first time here in this paper with, uh, with uh, Christiana. 
Um, so essentially, we proved the, the, the shadow theory for non-uniformly elliptic uh, problems. And this is, uh, uh, again, the same point that occurs in the paper by Jacqueline Tenjusti themselves. They note that, uh, that if you want to know uh, that the same results they hold for uh, operators like modeled uh, via perturbation on the minimal surface equation, then, uh, then you can you, you, you would like to assume um, uh, to gradient bounds. This is possible in certain cases, like this special structure, but not in every possible structure. Okay, so that's the first theorem. Uh, by, so I'm going to give uh, some model cases. So more, more general cases are in the paper. You can look at it. Um, so that's the first theorem with the Christiana. So get me a functional of this form, assume that we have a Hilder continuity with respect to B. So there's no order Lagrange equation still under a bound, which is of the same form that we have seen before with alpha over N. This is essentially a constant. This is a constant that uh, the blue, the, I mean, the blue written one is a constant that can be bounded from below and can be also improved uh, by more complicated expression. This is an easy reading one, but still you can, you can, uh, you can prove under the, 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 the natural uh, asymptotic, uh, the Hilder continuity of coefficients. And uh, when there is a dependence on B, so where the interaction between the regularizing term given by the gradient and, uh, so, and the and the irregularity of coefficients is more delicate, then you have to assume a bit more. So you cannot go at the maximal rate, but you can go to this later on. So this is just another theorem, but that's, uh, that's the, the one um, I, I strongly invite you to look at. So, so um, and now we go to the real shadow theory. So what happens when you do a perturbation, uh, paying the price, so I'm doing a square here, but then we, we can prove Schauder theory. And that's the first result that I'm aware of where you prove uh, Schauder theory in the non-uniformly elliptic case. Because essentially all the other methods used by the previous authors that you saw that they just failed. They uniformly fail in the non-uniformly elliptic case. Uh, also assume that this, uh, this, uh, this equation can be degenerate. And uh, in the non-degenerate case, because otherwise the Pilaplacian theory gives, uh, gives, gives counterexamples. So in the non-uniform elliptic case, we have a full analog of uh, uh, classical shadow estimates. So when you take a, when you take a non-degenerate but non-uniformly elliptic equation, then, uh, uh, then you can retrieve uh, the, the regularity of du essentially by the regularity of c and that's the same. And the same you can do if you have, uh, if you if you escape the realm of classical shadow estimates, you prove also the presence. You put also the presence of B, and this you have to assume this. And we conjecture that P larger than n cannot be removed uh, because uh, that the, there is a parallel with the vectorial theory um, when there where essentially. Uh, uh, classical de Georges theory fails. Uh, you don't have a priori under continuity of solutions, and then uh, you can have systems, uh, uniformly elliptic systems with the analytic coefficients, but irregular solutions, just because the coefficients depend on the, on the solution itself. But with this, we are able to do the same. We don't feel that this can be improved a lot. I mean, this, uh, and that's what I was saying. That's the parallel with, uh, with the classical theory. Okay, this is as long as the, the classical variational theory is considered. And uh, we also have, uh, we also have um, uh, theorems for general equations. In this case, you have an equation with PQ growth type. So the concept of energy solution uh, remains undefined. And in fact, we know from regularity theory that as soon as you consider non-energy solutions, then singularities appear. And therefore, there are two possible uh, approaches. The, the classical, I mean, there is the a priori regular one, so you get a W1Q solution. Solutions are usually considering W1P, but you take in the best phase, and then you prove the result. Or in the Russian style, that is the one I prefer, we, um, we provide the existence of a regular solution. So we consider the Dirichlet problem, and we say that there exists a solution with the other continuous gradient. And these are the theorems that we have. 
And so that's uh, essentially um, here, you don't need a variational structure. You go directly to equations and you prove Schauder theory. Of course, you get that the gradient is other continuous in the degenerate case and in the non-degenerate case, you have really the analog of the Schauder theory with the sharp exponent. And of course, you cannot, uh, you cannot uh, uh, rule out uh, uh, non-degeneracy because otherwise this result would be false. Uh, these are functionals for uh, these are results for modal functionals of uh, multiplicative structure. For general functionals, there is an additional problem that, that is the occurrence of the Lavrentiev phenomenon, and uh, this is more involved because the Lavrentiev phenomenon can occur also in the no in the, in the standard uniformly elliptic setting by the, the by considering the double phase functional. Uh, so the Laventia phenomenon cuts out regularity of minimizers, but it happens anyway. So the natural approach is to consider the so-called Lebesgue-Sering Marcellini extension, the so-called relaxed functional. So we take the functional and we take the lower semi-continuous envelope in the natural topology, but with respect to smoother functions. That's the classical approach introduced by Marcellini to described cavitation in the linear elasticity. So essentially cavitation occurs in the Marcellini's approach as a, as a, as a, uh, let's say, as a Lavrentiev phenomenon. So it's a very modern, uh, it's a very modern approach. And, uh, and then we introduce the so-called Lavrentiev gap uh, introduced uh, also by Butazza and Maisel and Maisel. In fact, I learned this from Vic Maisel. Um, um, so, we do the following. Either there's, uh, there's a Lavrentiev gap and then there's nothing to do with for your minimizers or there is no Lavrentiev gap. So we prove two theorems essentially. Actually, we only prove one theorem. The second one is a remark. We always prove that minimizers of this extension of the lebesgue sering marcellini extension are regular. So there are shadow estimates for these minimizers. And then we prove that when there is no Lavrentiev gap, then this, the, 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 the relaxed function, the minimizer of the relaxed functional and, the, uh, and the, the original ones, they do coincide. So we are able to transfer this result to your original minimizer. So this is something that you don't see for equations. Essentially, this approach, uh, it's a hidden fact, but this approach, the one of considering the, the relaxed functional replaces the one of considering uh, uh, approximating solutions to this. It's a dual approach. Okay, finally, let me tell you that there is more behind this PQ. And uh, let me tell you uh, another result on sharp dependence with respect to data. That's just a, a very brief glimpse of what is going on here. Um, so you consider minus Laplacian of U equal to something. What's the best space in order to guarantee that the U is continuous? Uh, the right hand side must be in this Lorentz space, which is defined by this decay on level sets. This is a sharp condition, is a classical result of Stein, uh, which is linked to this general Stein's theorem. That's the, uh, let's say, the borderline case of Sobol of Morey embedding here. Okay, a few years ago, it happened that this result that was believed to be of, na of linear nature was, uh, uh, was uh, in fact found to be true for general nonlinear equations and systems. That's a, a general, that's a, that's a model case. So get me a nonlinear uh, system of this type with Dini continuous coefficients. For instance, consider Hilder continuous coefficients is perfectly okay. But uh, with the right hand side, exactly the one being prescribed in the uh, in Stein's theorem, then you is continuous. And that's the nonlinear Stein's theorem. You can find several versions uh, also in these papers with Tomo Kusi from Edison. Okay, um, as a matter of fact, uh, this is independent of the, uh, this doesn't depend on uniform elliptic. This proves an old conjecture of Ralts about who believed that the condition guaranteeing that the right and that the solutions are Lipschitz was independent of P. And in fact, this condition is P independent. So we gave evidence to this old conjecture of Wealth. And in fact, uh, we found out first with Lisa Beck and then with Christiana De Filippis that this is uh, independent uh, of uniform elliptic. So if you do consider 
the approach like this, a functional like this, then the, the same thing also works under PQ conditions as those considered by Nachi. And there's a more recent paper by Cristiana De Filippi is appearing on this journal. It's a very long and technical paper with a very deep, I mean, iteration scheme that also proves this in the setting of partial regularity and quasi-convex integrals. And this again also be proved, and this is a recent paper of, uh, of, uh, of uh, De Filippis and myself, where coefficients are differential. Here we follow an approach of Eleuteri, Maskell, and Marcelli, we consider differentiable coefficients. And uh, a bit of differentiability above, and, and just uh, this Lorentz space condition guarantees that minimizers are locally bounded and therefore are continuous now. And you see, this is a result that works under uh, non polynomial growth conditions. So, this is another kind of problems and results. This is also applies to obstacle problems. It allows bilinearization procedure first introduced by Dutza and Fuchs, and then also by Fuchs and myself used in this setting. Uh, it applies to obstacle problems. We are able to find the sharp assumptions on the obstacle guaranteeing that uh, the, the, the function, that the gradient uh, is uh, locally bounded. And finally, this is the result of uh, Cristiana de Filippis uh, um, uh, that should not be, um, uh, that is not uh, the same of Guido de Filippis because there is pH in the, in the case of Guido and F in the case of Cristiana. And, um, and uh, Christiana proves essentially the same uh, result uh, in the setting of partial regularity. It's a new paper just appearing. Okay, I think I, I, I've said enough and um, Hunga would like to stop here. Probably I, I was long.